So the question that we want to consider today is, uh, what's next? What's next? Uh, if we look in terms of what's on God's calendar for the events that are, are going to occur, we are often bombarded by uh, the stuff, the philosophies, the structure of our world, and uh, they kind of challenge us to live in fear. We are told, for example, that climate change is going to, going to wipe us out. We are told that a nuclear holocaust is going to destroy us, that uh, recently, once again, the alien attack that's out there, there are these UFOs uh, and people from other planets, we assume, uh, that are going to come and infiltrate our, our world. And so I thought I'd look up, just for your encouragement, uh, the, the 10 most likely things that uh, will end our world. So I just want to encourage you with this thought this morning. And so uh, the individual wrote this. He said, uh, you know, nuclear war, uh, biological and chemical warfare, catastrophic climate change, ecological collapse, pandemics, asteroid impact, supervolcanic eruption, solar geoengineering, artificial intelligence, and then if there aren't enough, unknown risks. So that covers all the rest. And um, someone back in 1947 created what they referred to as the doomsday clock. And they originally set it for seven minutes before midnight. Midnight being the fact that the, everything blows up, everything disappears. It's the end of life on earth and, and everything just goes away. And, and, and when asked, why did you put it at seven minutes before midnight? He said, because I thought it looked good. There is no scientific evidence behind that whatsoever. The hand on the clock has been changed 25 times since 1947, with the most recent being in our year, 2023, and it was moved from 100 seconds before midnight to 90 seconds before midnight because of the events that are going on in Ukraine and the Ukrainian war. And so, uh, you know, that got a little bit of publicity. Some, some years ago, um, Peanuts cartoon... Uh, involved a conversation between Lucy and Linus. And Lucy's looking out the window, and it's raining like crazy. And she says this, boy, look at that rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus responds that it'll never do that, because in the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promises Noah that that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Rainbow. We had it first. And so... So, so Lucy, Lucy responded, you've taken a great load off my mind, to which Linus answered, sound theology has a way of doing that. Amen. And so our desire here at Valley Grace, as, as many other solid Bible-believing churches, is to introduce you or to remind you to sound theology, to remind you of sound doctrine to remind you of sound biblical teaching so that you might be able to live with hope that God gives to us, even in spite of what we see around us in this world. And what God has given to us is His Word that has been recorded for us without error. It's what we've been working our way through in, in our summer series called uh, Foundations of the Christian Faith. And the first thing we looked at was that the Bible is God's inspired word. It's given to without error. It has been protected over time and in the, the, without error in the original writings. And so we can guide ourselves. We can guide our lives. It tells us about who God is, tells us about who Jesus is. And that you and I can go to the Bible and we can understand that God has given to us truth. Secondly, in our series, we looked at about the fact is who is God? And the fact that there is a God who has created us, and we see that in the world around us, but we also find that truth recorded for us in Scripture, the only book that God ever wrote in all 66 uh, books of the Bible. Then we looked at who is Jesus Christ? What has He done for us? Who is He? Well, He is the God-man who came down into our world. He is God and He is man at the Incarnation. And as a result of that, He came into our world to be our Savior because we could not save ourselves. We were separated from God. And so Jesus Christ came down into our world, lived among us, lived on this planet, experienced what you and I do, and then went to the cross, paid for our sins and our failures, of sins and failures of the whole world, that there is nothing too big, too atrocious, for the blood of Jesus Christ, because he's God. And he was able to die because he's man. And then he was buried because he really died. And then he rose again. And then he's ascended back into heaven. 
We looked at who is the Holy Spirit that takes God's truth and applies it to our life, begins a process of, of drawing us to Jesus because dead people don't make the first move. And so because we were dead in our trespasses and sin, as the Bible puts this, the Holy Spirit begins drawing us to himself and begins that process whereby we are born again as uh, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. Unless you're born again, you cannot experience eternal life. And so we looked, we looked, at, we looked at that. And then, then we also considered who is man? That God created mankind, male and female, in the image of God. Both male and female have the image of God. And as a result of that, we have the opportunity of of a relationship with Christ, with God. That God placed Adam and Eve in the garden and gave them a test. He wasn't interested in robots. He wanted individuals who would follow him, who would choose to, to follow him. And only one thing, everything else is there for you, just don't touch this. And... Satan came and deceived Eve, and we read in the New Testament that Adam really knew what he was doing. And as a result of that, they ate, and they were uh, kicked out of the garden, and there was separation. Death has entered into the human race. And yet God prepared a way, even for Adam and Eve, and for us to have a renewed relationship who were dead in trespasses and sin. And then we looked at what is salvation, that Jesus came into our world and has, has given to us the opportunity of knowing him by what he has done, salvation in the Christian life, that we are called to live for Christ in the time that we've been allotted here on planet Earth. And then what is the church? Last week as we considered the fact that, that God created the church to be a spiritual family in order that you might, be, you might grow and nourish, be nourished and that you might have an impact just as any physical family and that you really cannot develop without, without the, being involved in a local church. And that is what God has designed. It's our mission and to make other followers of Jesus, to help people become followers of Jesus, as that um, we were told in Matthew 28. And so this morning, we want to look at what's next. Uh, and then next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at what, what are angels. And then at the end, uh, in, in, in September 3rd, how does it all end? So we're not going to get to how does it all end today. We're going to look at what's next uh, in, this, in this process. Now, this is going to be a bit of an experiment. <clears throat> so uh, we're, we're going to see how it goes because I'm going to try and put some things up on our, uh, our board here to try and visualize some of the places where we are going. Now, I want to encourage you that the things that we are talking about, that we're dealing with some things that, that deal with today but also deal with, with tomorrow and, and down the road, that, that many of these things are prophecies. And there are those who would say, well, do they really... Do they really happen? Well, look at the prophecies of the Bible. And how many of those, I mean, all of those that have been fulfilled, there are still some that are still future. But we read, for example, Micah, 700 years before Jesus comes, said, hey, I want you to know that Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Who would have guessed? It's a little town nobody cares about. We read in Daniel of the events that were future for Daniel. And Though the names aren't given, we can certainly understand who's involved. We look at the fact that Alexander the Great rises up and, and runs quickly and subdues much into an empire, the Greek empire, and then suddenly he dies. And then his kingdom is divided among four of his generals. We see that in the Bible. It's predicted. It's prophetic. We read about the fact that Jesus is going to come, uh, Isaiah uh, 52, 53, 700 years before Jesus comes, that Jesus is going to come, Messiah is going to come. He's going to walk upon the earth. He's going to die, he's going to be, but not a bone in his body is going to be broken. We read that in Psalms, which is a thousand years before Jesus comes. And that Jesus was going to be buried in the, the tomb of a rich man and and yet then he, he was going to be glorified. That is, he was going to rise. So we, we find prophecies, and God hasn't missed it. And so as you and I come to the text this morning, or text this morning, we can be assured that what God tells us is going to happen is going to happen. So here's where I want to go with us. We want to look at some of the event, uh, situation where we find ourselves today, and then we'll move into the process of some future things. 
And so if you have a Bible, uh, you know, the background, what's taking place today? We look and, and, and we wonder what in the world is taking place when we consider all the junk, all the bad stuff that is going on in our world. And is it going to get better? Is it, you know, what, why are we here? And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to hit a number of passages. Some of them will be on the screen. Some of them will not. Um, I don't want this to be like a Bible drill, sword drill, you know, who's got it, who's not. But, but there's so many different pieces and parts that, that are important for us to understand. When, when we get done, you don't, this, there will not be a test over it all. And yet I hope you're able to at least see the broad perspective, what, knowing what's coming next. So the, the age in which we are living, you know, what's going on in today's world? Why are the things the way they are? are? Are things going to get better and better? And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, let me begin in verse 1. But realize this, in last days, difficult times will come. We are living in last days. And we understand that Jesus could come back at any point in time, but, but the challenge has been, even as... Paul writes to Timothy, we're in the last day. These events we're going to see. Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal haters of good. I mean, we look at some of this stuff and we, we see people doing things and they're absolutely brutal and we're thinking, what in the world? How does that happen? They're going to be those who are haters of good. And, and, and we see that the, it's getting all turned upside down, isn't it? The good is being called bad and the bad is being called good. It, it, it's part of what's going to happen. There are those who are going to be treacherous. There are those who are going to be reckless. There are those who are conceited. There are those who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, though they have denied its power. The, you know, we hear about, well, you know, I'm spiritual. I'm not a Christian, but I'm spiritual or I'm religious. That's what it's talking about. And so we are to avoid such individuals. Say, why is that going on? Because we are denying more and more of who Jesus is and what he's done. We don't want to read God's word. We don't want to live by it, either publicly or privately. We want to do our own thing. And so the residual effect of what Christianity has done, we are seeing that it is becoming less and less in society. We used to hear terminology, the Judeo-Christian ethic. It's dying. In fact, it's almost seen as a bad thing. And so we, the, what God has given to us in Scripture is for our flourishing as human beings, is for our flourishing as human beings. And, and so that's what God has done. And when we choose to reject God's principles and precepts, we find ourselves in trouble. And frankly, I think if we're honest, most of us would admit the times we've gotten ourselves mostly in trouble is when we have rejected what God has told us. Now, there are some times that other people do make some choices that we have no, uh, we can't control, and it affects us. That's true. Sin is not a private matter. But there are events that happen, vast majority of the time, it's because of choices and decisions that we make or that are made within our culture and our society rejecting God. So, so things are going to get more difficult. You say, well, thanks for the hope. Well, God's still in control. God is still in control. That's where we are today. And so then, what's, what's next on the picture? And some of us, we need this reality, but they're, they're, I'm, I've incorporated two things, calling it death and the intermediate state. Every single one of us in this room unless Jesus comes back, are going to die. Say, well, thanks. Well, you know, it's interesting. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a feast. It's better to go to a funeral than to a party. And he says the reason for that is because all of us, under, we need to be reminded that what has happened to that individual is going to happen to us. And so we need to be prepared. It isn't a morbid thing. We need to be prepared. I don't care. You may have the, the best cardiologist. He still has a 100% failure rate. You may eat all of your oatmeal and your tofu. It's 
Not going to help. Maybe it prolongs you. Maybe it doesn't. The bottom line is every single one of us are going to come to a point in our lives where we step out of this life. It goes back to the garden where God told Adam and Eve, when you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. And it includes two things, physical death, which took them a long time to do, but spiritual death, which was immediate separation from God. And God provided a way for spiritual death to be handled, to be conquered, but physical death still comes. And so we read, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21, in Adam all die. Because of what Adam has done, every single human being dies. It goes back to Adam. It's in our genes, it's in our genetics, and we can try and live a little longer, but it's not what's going to happen. And then, as in Adam, all die, verse 22, but in Christ we'll all be made alive. You say, oh, that means everybody's going to be saved. No, 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about those who have responded to the gospel. The first five verses of 1 Corinthians 15 says this is what the gospel is, that those who believe the fact that Jesus lived, died, and rose again and put their faith and trust in him, that's the gospel. So this is for those who have trusted Christ. So if we're going to draw a timeline, and we're going to attempt to do that, and we would say, for example, that we're, we're going to start kind of where Jesus came down to earth, all right? So Jesus came down, we're going to use blue, and when did he come? Come on, come on, you're allowed to talk. Incarnation. The birth of Jesus, Bethlehem, all of that, all right? So Jesus came down, lived among us, he went to the cross, and then he ascended back into heaven, and that is called the ascension, all right? Um, and so Jesus now is back in heaven. You and I are living in this time frame. Well, I, I think the best terminology is to call it the church age. that we are living in the church age at this point in time. So, here, here we are, all right? What is that? It's a people. It's a people. Could be you, could be me. My, my mother was an artist and taught art. You would think I could do better. All right, so, so we're living on planet Earth. Right now, we're 2023. All right, so God, God created human beings, and he put within us, he give, gave to us, we're two parts. We're made up of two parts. We're made up of the physical body, what you and I see, but we're also made up of the soul, the spirit, the immaterial part of us. So I think we're two parts. The spiritual side of us and the physical side of us. And so there's this reference to the fact that it's because we have the soul that we, can, we are made in the image of God. We can have fellowship with God because we have soul, a soul, a spirit. This is what separates people, humanity, from animals. Now, I know there are many of you who are animal lovers. It might be horses, or it could be dogs, or it could be cats. It could be any of those. I'm sorry to tell you, your, your prized animal does not have a spirit, does not have a soul. Now, that may be tragic to you today. I'm sorry, but we need to tell you the truth, right? But you have a soul. You have a soul. And you may love those animals, and that's fine. But we have a soul, and we have a body. And so when, when a, a person dies, that is the separation of the soul or spirit. I'm using those two words interchangeably. That is a separation of the soul and, the, and or, or the spirit from the body, okay? That's death. We don't have a really good way to evaluate that. We've tried different things, you know, when the heart stops, but you can keep the heart pumping. When brain waves cease, that's probably one of the best. When the brain waves cease, but you can still keep things going. But, but whenever the spirit or the soul leaves the body, that's when death has occurred. There are two ultimate destinies for that spiritual part of us when we die. If you know Jesus, 
your soul goes to be with Jesus. Your body, something like that, is laid in the ground. For a person who does not know Jesus, their soul does not go to be in the presence of Christ, but goes to a place of torment. And we'll, we'll find that in just a minute. So what happens now is you're, you're in a process that is called the intermediate state. You, you are you're still in existence, but you don't have a glorified body. You don't have a resurrected body. No one has a resurrected body until resurrection. So there is this intermediate state that is uh, taking place. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse... Well, we'll start off in beginning in verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens... So he's referencing the fact that we have, we have a body, but we're going to at one point, this, this earthly tent, this body, sometimes it's referred to as a, a building, sometimes it's referred to as a tent, sometimes it's referred to as a clay pot, that, that when this body ex- ceases to exist, at some point in time, we're going to get a resurrected body, we're going to get an intermediate body. But in between that time frame, we are in between. It's the intermediate state. We do not yet have a glorified body. For indeed, this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Now, the longer we live, the more we realize the reality of that verse, the groaning of the body. When you are younger, you leap out of bed in the morning just ready for the day. As you grow older... You groan getting out of bed in the morning, saying, well, what did I do to get that? Oh, I must have just slept wrong. You know, you realize that this body is wearing out. This tent is wearing out. And in as much as we have put it on, we don't want to be unclothed. And, and so this being unclothed is when the soul goes back to, for those who are believers, goes back to be in the presence of Jesus, though the body is still is going to be buried. We don't, want, we don't like this unclosed state, but we're going to be there. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This life is mortal. It is temporary. It is not eternal life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God himself, gave to us a spirit as a pledge. And I'm going to go on to verse 6. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in, uh, in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We, we haven't seen heaven. We haven't seen what's beyond there. Those who have died in Christ are now walking by sight. They're in the presence of Jesus. Don't yet have a glorified body. And we're of good courage, and I say prefer rather to be absent from the body than and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, verse 9 we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Because this is a reality, and because future is a reality, we seek to live our lives today to please Jesus. Now there's a, con- I mentioned, I said, you know, that what happens, this is, we're talking about a Christian, a follower of Jesus. For the non-Christian, you say, well, what happens to his or her soul? It goes down into a place of torment. It's not the ultimate end. It's not the lake of fire, but it's a place of torment. And Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 16. I don't know that we have that. So let me read it to you. Beginning uh, Luke chapter 16 and beginning in verse 19. And some of you remember it's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. All right. Now, there was a rich man, verse 19 of Luke 16. There was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple fine linen, joyously living in a splendor of life. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at the gate, covered with sores, and was longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his wounds. And the poor man died and was carried away to uh, Abraham's bosom. Rich man also died and was buried. And the rich man in Hades, verse 23, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So there, there, there's a distinction. Now, what Jesus is indicating in that time frame and in that process, which is really true to, in, in many ways today, 
There are those who think that, that if you have a lot of good stuff, if things have gone well for you, if you've got your big bank account, if everything is moving really nicely for you, if you, you that, that God has blessed you, and in a sense, he really has. And someone who doesn't have much of anything, like the poor man, uh, you know, God, God doesn't, you know, he, he's not in God's favor. That was the typical thinking of the day, and Jesus flipped it around and basically saying, no, just because you have a lot of stuff doesn't mean that God has blessed you and you're going to heaven, and just because you don't have stuff doesn't mean that you're going separated from God. And so Jesus flips it around. It's the poor man, Lazarus, who had put his faith and trust in the one true God. The rich man hadn't. He had been trusting in his riches. So there's this separation now. The poor man, Lazarus, goes to be in Abraham's bosom. And this is, this is pre, pre-church, all right? It, it, it's Old Testament economy. He went to a place that we would, would be called paradise. Not, not what we would refer to as heaven, but a place of blessing. And the, poor, the, the rich man went to a place of torment. And so you see in verse 24, and the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip it the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham uh, said, child, remember that during your life you received a lot of good things. Lazarus didn't, verse 26. Besides, there's this great gulf. There's a separation. There's a great gulf that's between us. There's a great chasm, and those who wish to come over, you can't go back and forth. And he said, well, then I beg you, Father Abraham, that you send, you send Lazarus to my father's house. Why? For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not come to a place of torment. Isn't that interesting? This rich man in a place of torment gets concerned about evangelism. I want my brothers. I've got five brothers and I don't want them to come here. It's a place of torment. You've probably had conversations with individuals who jokingly kind of say, well, you know, it's no big deal. When I die, I'm going to be with all my buddies and we're going to, you know, it's going to be a big tailgate party. It doesn't even say that the rich man saw anybody else. What if it's solitary? It's not going to be, you know, we're not going to be with your drinking buddies. It's a place of torment. In fact, when an individual gets there, they're going to want to say, tell my friends, don't come. Prepare for this event. It's going to happen to you. You need to be prepared. So he says, I've got five brothers, verse 28, in order that they warn him not to come. Verse 29, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, so let them hear them. In other words, you've got the Bible. You've got scripture. You've got Old Testament that warns about these things. The rich man says, no, 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 Father Abraham, but if someone goes back to them from the dead, then they'll repent. If we get, just, just raise somebody, send Lazarus, raise him from the dead, have him go back, have a conversation with my brothers. Tell them that this is real. And then verse 31. But he said to them, Abraham said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. I mentioned last week, and it looked like some of the individuals were rather surprised when I said that no one ever came to faith in Jesus because of miracles. It's always through the spoken word and the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Here's proof of that. Someone gets raised from the dead, comes back, and says, hey, you know, I I was dead, but now I'm alive, and no. They won't believe. Look Look at the Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead, Mary and Martha. Jesus brought Lazarus out of the grave. Everybody knew he was dead. In fact, they said, you know, by now he's starting to stink. He's been there for a few days. And Lazarus was raised from the dead. The enemies of Jesus knew and said, well, we need to get rid of the evidence. Let's kill him again. That didn't sound like too exciting, did it? And, and, and so in, in this intermediate state, there are, there are two places. This is not yet the, re- the resurrection, all right? There are only two places, only two choices when you and I step out of this life and and, and into the, when we die, we're either going into the presence of Christ, which Paul said, absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. 
instantaneously. We do not go to Abraham's bosom because Jesus emptied that after he rose from the dead. We go immediately into the presence of Jesus. You know Jesus, you put your faith and trust in him, you will go immediately into the presence of Jesus. If you step out of this life not knowing Christ, you go into a place of torment. According to the Bible. According to God. That's pretty serious, and yet that gives us hope. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Your, your loved one who stepped out of this life, being a follower of Jesus, is in the presence of Jesus. That individual is now seeing what we walk by faith. They've seen this wounds in his hand, the spear mark in his side. They have heard the choirs of heaven. They, they're in the presence of Christ. They don't have a, physic, a, a glorified body yet, but it's in the intermediate state, in the presence of Jesus. Some false views. Soul sleep. Some individuals say, well, you know, when you die, you just, you just kind of go into the soul sleep. That's not what this says. The, the, the man, the rich man in punishment, in a place of torment, Knew he was, he was, he was awake. Jesus, you say, was this a parable? Is this a real thing? Well, Jesus told the story to say this, this is what happens. The person who knows Christ is in the presence of Jesus. It's not soul sleep. You just don't go into some neutral state, as some would tell us. Secondly, you don't go to purgatory. That comes out of 2 Maccabees chapter 12, which we don't have in our Bibles. It's kind of an instructive uh, book, Maccabees, but it's not, we don't believe it's inspired by God. Why do we not, what's the purpose of purgatory? According to those who make, have that teaching, it's the fact that the person who's been baptized within the church will ultimately go to heaven if they're a member of this particular brand of, of church, will, will immediately, you, you know, when they die, will, will immediately go to heaven. They'll go to a place of purgatory. They, they're headed to heaven, but they're just not going to make it yet. That they need to go to purgatory because they need to have their sins removed because we're all sinners. And um, you and I can help the process if we pay some money, if we do some things, if we have religious activity, we can, we can do something for those who have already died. No, we can't do anything for those who have already died. And here's the reason. Because when you and I place our faith in Jesus, we are justified. That means we are declared righteous. It is not our righteousness, it is his righteousness. So that when we stand before God, God sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ that clothes us and understands that we have been sinners, but now we're in the presence of Christ. We don't have anything else to get rid of because Jesus has declared us righteous. Purgatory by some, I mean, they're millions and millions of years. And you never really quite know when they're done. No. No, no. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No detours. No detours. And then there's, there's a third false view, and there are probably a lot of other ones, but you cease to exist. You know, just kind of, that's the end of it. You kind of had a beginning, and that's the end, and that's how life goes. Sorry. Sorry about that. Hope you had a good run. Hope you had a good journey. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a great passage, and I encourage you to go back and read that chapter because it is a chapter on the resurrection. He said, if, if we have hope in Christ only in this life, we're of most, most men most miserable. Because we're banking on eternity. We're saying that there's something else beyond here. We, we are living in light of eternity. We're not grabbing for all the gusto. And so everyone goes to one of two places when we die. And no prayers for the dead, no, uh, but we're both disembodied, both the believer and the unbeliever. All right, so you say, well, then, okay, so, so what, what comes next? Well, I think, I think, and this is 1 Thessalonians 4, I, I think it's the rapture of the church. I'm pretty convinced about that. And so we'll talk about it in just a moment. All right, so rapture of the church, which is at the beginning of what comes next, which is the tribulation. I messed up the, the uh, color marking here, sorry. You have to just kind of go along with it. Tribulation, 
which is seven years, but we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. All right, so this is the rapture of the church. Jesus is in heaven. Those who are followers of Jesus are with him. And so take, uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It'll be up on the screen uh, as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. By the way, uh, before we jump into this passage, this is what Jesus is referring to in John 14, 1 through 3. Remember? That uh, I'm getting ready to go away, and if I go to my Father's house, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again. The rapture of the church. I will come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then good old Thomas. Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. Jesus, in essence, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is only one way into the presence of Jesus, and that's through Jesus. All right? That's John 14, 1 through 6. Because Jesus doesn't want any of us to be fogged or confused on how to get to heaven, how to have a relationship with God. It is only through the person of Jesus. It isn't by good works that we have done. The works that we have done are important, but they're not the saving piece. And so in John chapter, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me begin in verse 13. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so you do not grieve as the rest who, do, who have no hope. Now what seems to have happened is that there seems to have been um, a teaching going around that the rapture had already occurred and that some individuals had missed it. And so Paul is writing and saying, no, you haven't missed it. I want you to understand what this rapture is all about. So we don't want you to be uninformed about what's coming next. Those who are asleep, it's, it's reference to those who die. The word cemetery means sleeping places, in case you didn't know it. That's free of charge today. You know, it means sleeping place because you've seen, oh, it looks like they're sleeping, right? So it, those who are asleep, the body looks like it is Asleep, so that you don't grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep with Christ. Notice verse 14 is the condition. Those who believe that Jesus died and rose again for them. That's the gospel. We're talking about Christians. We're talking about believers in this section. Then verse 15 for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not go before, precede those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God will sound, dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore comfort one another with these words. What's he saying? He's talking about the rapture. And, and so at the rapture, what we, those who are alive, those who are still on earth when this event happens, won't go before those who have already died, talking about Christians. So what happens? Well, God takes this body, glorifies it, resurrects it. It's, it's now being changed. And the soul, those who he brings so that together they are reunited into a glorified body. It's the resurrected body. It's the glorification that's referred to in the New Testament in the Bible. Say, what, is this, what does this body look like? What Jesus had after his resurrection. His is the prototype, the first of its kind. It's a heavenly body. Prototype, I don't mean experimental. It is the kind of body that you and I will receive at the rapture of the church, when we go to meet Jesus, if we are dead, if we go to meet Jesus in the air, we get a glorified body. Uh, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes that this earthly body is made for earthly living. It's made for down here. But that there is a heavenly body made for heavenly living. And you can see the kinds of things that Jesus did. And so those who have died... Uh, will be, their bodies will be, you say, well, what happens if they were burned in a fire? Jesus isn't going to have any problem putting you back together. He created you to begin with, but he's not going to have any problem putting you back together. Yeah, you know, yes, dust to dust and all that, which is true. But Jesus is going to put that body back together. 
Will, will, will I know people? Yeah, you're going to look. I don't know what age you're going to be. I don't think we're going to get to choose. You know, I, I don't know what age. Some have suggested 30 couple because that's what Jesus was. I think that's a stretch. I have no idea. But it's going to be like you. Will, will, will we know each other? Yeah, absolutely. We're not going to be dumber in heaven than we are down here. <laughs> See, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Okay, I'll give you an example. When, when Jesus rose from the grave and Mary was in the garden, and I think she had tears in her eyes, it was early morning, and, and she heard, she thought Jesus was the gardener. Jesus called her name, Mary. The voice print gave him away. He sounded like Jesus. Why? Because he was Jesus. You'll sound like you because you're you. And we'll be able to know. And then she understood. And when the disciples in the upper room, when Jesus appeared, they knew it was Jesus. So, those who are dead are going to have the body. We get, this is where the, the uh, resurrection occurs. This point here, no glorified body. Hence, we call it the intermediate state. And Paul says, I don't like to be unclothed. I don't like to be, some of the texts use naked. And he's talking about the fact that we don't have body. It doesn't mean we're running around with any clothes on. So resurrected, then those who are alive and remain go to meet him in the air. And, and that's the rapture. And so you see in verses 16 to 18, first of all, it's the return of Jesus, first part of verse 16. Secondly, there's a resurrection that takes place. And, and, and then thirdly, there's the rapture, which we go to meet in the air. That's verse 17. The last part of verse 17, we go together to meet them Who's the them? It's those who have died in Christ. So there's a reunion. This is the hope that we have as followers of Jesus. That there is a reunion of those whom we love and we care about who have died in Christ. The tragedy is those who never trusted Christ. They're not resurrected here. We'll come to it in a couple weeks, Lord willing, of what happens when we look at that last part. So there's this reunion. There's a reunion. And then notice last uh, verse 18. There's some reassurance. Therefore do what? Comfort one another with these words. This, this is real. This isn't make believe. This is real. And so it's the rapture of the church. We get a glorified body. The re-embodiment and instantaneous change. Just like that. You say, well, and then, then we, move into, uh, we move into the tribulation, but hang on for just a moment, because we're going to be up here with Jesus. End of tribulation occurs after seven years. Jesus is going to come back, which is really the second coming. This isn't really the second coming. This is the rapture. So this is the second coming. So what's going on? We're going to look at tribulation really quickly, uh, just a few minutes. Okay, so, so what's going on up here when we have been to be up with Jesus? What's taking place? Well, the, thing, the truth is that you and I are having our works evaluated of what we've done down here. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we read this, beginning in verse 10. According to the grace that was given to me by, uh, to be a wise builder, I laid a foundation no one else can, can uh, do upon it. Now verse 12. If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, each man's work will become evident. It's going to become seen. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire itself. It will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So the point is that while this is, tribulation is going to be taking place down here, for those who are followers of Jesus, we're at what is often referred to as the Bema, B-E-M-A, which is just taking Greek word and putting English letters to it. It's the judgment seat of Christ. And, and what's being evaluated is not whether a person is a Christian. 
What's being evaluated is how did they live their life as a follower of Jesus? The things that I do, are they wood, hay, and stubble? Are they gold, silver, and precious stone? How did I live my life? God's called each of us to, in a calling, in a vocation. As parents, as children, as co-workers, as family, as friends. So how, do, how am I living my life with what's been given to me here? Now, let me just back up for one moment and give you... This, this is what is referred to as a pre-tribulation rapture. And that's what I think fits the text, Daniel's 70th week and a whole bunch of things. If you've been with us on Wednesday night, you're kind of following, tracking with that a little bit. There are those good people who say, no, I think that the, the church goes through ha- the first half of the tribulation and, and then things really get bad. So they call it mid-trib, that that's when the rapture takes place. There are others who say, no, no, I think it happens at the end of the tribulation, post-tribulation. Uh, and I don't think that's the way it works, again, based on Daniel's uh, layout for us. Uh, but these are good people who have a little different view. They, they love God. They love Jesus. Um, they may just find themselves they got moved out here instead of here. You know, it's okay. Uh, so, so here our works are being evaluated. Then look at verse 17. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And therefore it matters how we live. Say, so, well, how do, you, how do you know that's where it happens? Well, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul refers to the Bema seat of Christ, beginning in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat, Bema, seat of Christ, so that each one of us may be re- repaid for his works in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, whether useless. The, the bad there is the word useless. We're going to receive, what did we do for the cause of Christ? What did, what did I do just for me? What did I do that I, I should have, what did I what, uh, not do that I should have done? What did I do that I should not have done? Now, there is forgiveness for sin, don't misunderstand, but the bottom line is the time that's allotted to us, whether it be 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years, is going to be evaluated. It's a gift of God so that we might use our lives to impact those around us for the kingdom, for eternity. And so we're going to be repaid, recompensed. Either we suffer loss. You know, that's a tragedy to be given life and to waste it. Every single one of us at some point in time, we've wasted some pieces of our life. We get that. But God in his grace and his mercy comes alongside and he, he changes us and he makes us. And as uh, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we become trophies of God's grace for all eternity. Some were saved out of sin. Some were saved from a, a, a failed life. I shouldn't say all, all of us are saved out of sin. And, and, and some are saved from, some are saved out of. It's all God's gift. Therefore, because we know this is going to happen, verse 11, therefore, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest to you. Therefore, we live, we live different. All right, so, so that's what's going on in heaven. And then quickly, we need, to hit, we need to hit this part. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. This takes us to Matthew 24. If you want to turn there, because there's, there's a lot in there. Um, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, let me just give you the outline on this and, and maybe we'll tag it next time when we come together, just, just a tad. But so what's taking place on earth? Now Jesus is going out and his disciples, they, they say the beauty of the temple, that's verses one through three. And then in verse, verses one and two, verse three, And Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives with his disciples in their privacy saying, tell us when these things are going to be because Jesus said the temple is going to be destroyed, which was magnificent. It it took him 80 years to build the temple and within five years it was destroyed, 70 AD. So it's it's future for the disciples. You know, this is around 30 some AD. So it's, you know, it's a few, few years down the road. And what will be a sign of your coming? How do we know when you're coming? And so I think beginning in verses uh, 4 through 14, Jesus says, here's the, first half, here's the first half of the tribulation. When you see these things starting to occur, understand that the tribulation is on this. And he lists a number of things that we see around us today. That we're not called to be stupid. And they weren't either. See, don't let anyone mislead you. People are going to come and say, I'm Jesus. Verse 6, when you're hearing of wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not frightened. These things must take place. 
Ukraine, those kinds of things we see, they've got to happen. Nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes, fires. All these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. You're going to be delivered up to tribulation. And then beginning in verse 15 and going down to verse 28 is the last half of the tribulation referred to as the great tribulation halfway through Antichrist uh, is made manifest. Uh, he's made a peace treaty with Israel. He breaks it. And so that's that peace. And so we see that things get worse and worse. In fact, it's interesting. Look at verse 22, if you have a Bible open, of Matthew 24. Unless the, because if you remember in, in trip, uh, Revelation 6 through 19, horrific situations that occur on earth during the seals, bowls, and trumpet judgments. And, and, and they're horrific. And it says this, verse 22, unless those days had been shortened, tribulation, that God is focusing on those who have rejected him, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days would have been cut short. There are two things in there. Number one is the sovereignty of God. He's going to cut those days short. He's, he's overseeing this. The world isn't gone in chaos, but it also shows his mercy. Unless those days were cut short, that's God's mercy. We don't have time to go through all the rest of that. Second, uh, the end of 29 through 31 is, is Christ's second coming, which is here. And we'll take a look at that in a couple weeks, Lord willing, as we kind of flesh out the rest of, so how does it all, how does it all end? And what Jesus tells us to do is to live, to live faithfully and to live expectantly. You may miss all of the other stuff. Live faithfully and live expectantly. We're called to live our lives in light of eternity. And I ask you, many of you here have already made a decision for Christ. You have already chosen to accept what Jesus has done for you, and so this this is your destiny. It might be that there are some of you are still questioning. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure who Jesus is. I've not made a commitment to him yet. If you step out of this life and into eternity without trusting Christ, there are no second chances. This is it. Prayers for the dead don't work. That ultimately, it's separation from Christ in a place of torment, which is not the ultimate end. Will you put your faith and trust in Jesus? He died for you because he loves you. He died for me because he loved me. And our only way into the presence of Christ is through what Jesus has done. And so we're given the mandate and responsibility. Somebody told us about Christ. How about your kids? Your grandkids? How about your parents? How about family? How about friends? Co-workers, people that you come across to, every single one of us are headed toward eternity, separated from Christ, unless we make a decision for Jesus. I don't know if you saw, and we don't know when, when we're going to step into eternity. We don't, we don't know when the rapture is going to be. In fact, Peter says it's not because God is slow about his promise, but he doesn't want anybody to, to miss it. But there comes a point in time where it's the end. It's kind of like Noah's Ark, which is you find in Matthew 24. That when the door was shut, the, the opportunity to, to make a decision was over. I read this past week, maybe some of you did as well. And it, it, the tragic story has happened within the last week or two. Family of four is driving down 81 in an RV coming back from probably just having a really good time together, mom and dad, a 21, 22-year-old daughter and a teenage son. Front tire in the RV blows out, takes them across the center line to hit a tractor trailer head on. All four individuals in the RV were killed as well as a tractor trailer driver. None of them expected that they were going to step into eternity that day. And so we need to be ready. That's what Jesus said. When you see these, you know, just be ready. Just be ready. John writes, everyone who has this hope doesn't mean that we say, okay, I, I, get, I get it made. No. Purifies himself. Purifies himself. You see, Jesus is not an accessory to your life. He's a central thing. We just don't put him on. He's a central thing. 
And so we're called to make followers, followers of Jesus. So we live our lives in light of eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth that you've given to us in a confusing world. We see around us people who are hopeless and thinking that the, the end might be near and we don't know what comes next. You've given to us truth that if we place our faith and trust in the completed work of Christ, that whether we live or die in the days ahead, it's a win-win. We get to be in the presence of Jesus while we're here on the earth. We have the privilege of family, friends, and sharing the good news. Thank you that there are those who told us about Christ. And Father, that becomes our responsibility. Only two destinies, only two destinations, no other options. And eternity and eternal life is only found in Jesus, not in our works, but in what he's done. And so we realize that Christ is our only hope in this life and in death. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen.